Sports are a microcosm of society, but also a grand or not so grand arena where joy, failure, and perseverance play out for others to see. As such, sports provide a perfect platform for athletes to voice ideas and bring injustice to light. We, their fans, are a captive audience. But over the years, activism in sports hasn't just been frowned upon, it has been adamantly and forcibly opposed. The Olympic 200 meters gold and bronze medalists had been suspended by the United States Olympic Committee and given 48 hours to leave Mexico. In the aftermath of the LA riots, he delivered a letter to President George H.W. Bush detailing the problems plaguing the country. Hodges believes that moment of activism led to his never playing again in the NBA. Get that son of a bitch off the field right now. Out. He's fired. He's fired! But in the last several years, there seems to have been a shift. After a lull that lasted for decades, sports activism again has found a voice. In presidential commendations given to athletes who spoke out against racial oppression in the 1960s, on social media, as whole teams donned hoodies to advocate for black victims of gun violence. In public letters, denouncing a team co-owner who was running for the U.S. Senate. Well, there was a letter written from the players, signed by all the players, basically saying like, no, we're not going for it. Like, black lives do matter and we're not going for it. And people were getting behind us because they knew what was at stake for us. Like, they know, like, we're making our voices heard and doing all this and we're sacrificing so much. Like, we're sacrificing. This is our job. This is our livelihood. Lately, sports activism has taken on world leaders. Fans have seen Britney Griner-inspired clothing popping up throughout the WNBA with entire teams coming to their games in these We Are BG shirts and hoodies. Even college athletes, long barred from speaking out, have recognized the platform they stand upon, and they've used it. For far too long, Black Americans have suffered under systems of racism and oppression. This time, it's different. This time, we had enough. As members of the Ohio State football team, we have a platform not only in Central Ohio, but around the globe. We stand in solidarity with the Black community and equal rights for all. Experts who study activism in professional sports and those who study the impacts of racism on college athletes, including Ohio State alumnus Joy Gaston Gales, say overt and covert racism have been an inflection point for athletes to speak out. You have this moment that broke the camel's back moment where it's like, I'm, I have to say something. I can no longer let this ride because if you don't stand for something, you end up falling for everything and anything. In this episode of the Ohio State University Inspire podcast, as we commemorate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we look at the role of sports in advancing civil rights in the United States and how athletes have come to balance their lives on the playing field with the realities they live and see in the world outside the sports arena. I'm Robin Chenoweth. Carol Del Grosso is our audio engineer. Megan Beery is our student intern. Inspire is a production of the College of Education and Human Ecology. If you think social activism in sports began when 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick took a knee during the national anthem, you may not know the rich history of civil rights advocacy in American sports. Kwame Adjamong is Associate Professor of Sport Management at Ohio State, who studies how Black sports professionals respond to injustice. I'm really interested in how social actors, such as an athlete or a, a working sport professional, or even an organization, responds to unjust institutions and also their efforts to both tear down and create new and just ways of life and institutions. So how does race impact athletes in America? Yeah, that's a, it's a loaded question, something that I've discussed and written about. I don't even think you could get that all in just one book. Donovan Mitchell, who plays for the Cleveland Cavaliers, he was recently speaking about his experience while playing for the Utah Jazz. He's talking about how playing in Cleveland has been much different because he sees people who look like him in the stands. and The treatment that Black athletes are subjected to, um, a lot of, of which white athletes don't have to encounter did he feel it when he was on the court? 
Yeah, he talks about that in his interview. And that's not just him. There's a number of players who have talked about uh, not only the jeering or booing, because that's that's normal in sports, but it's the thing that the fans are saying to these athletes, racial epithets or uh, saying you know personal things. And we've seen this a lot more in recent years with fans being removed from games because of the things that they have been saying to these athletes and about them. In the Anscape interview, in fact, Donovan Mitchell says it was draining, dealing with off-court issues, like fans' response to his activism to stop the bullying of Black kids in Utah. He said, It became a lot to have to deal with on a nightly basis. I got pulled over once. I got an attitude from a cop until I gave him my ID. And that forever made me wonder what happens to the young Black kid in Utah that doesn't have that power to be just like, this is who I am. And that was one of the things for me that I took to heart. Much of the antagonism toward Mitchell came in the form of social media, which also has given athletes a broader platform to advocate for equity. But the pushback is anything but new. I asked Kwame Ajimong about this. You do see more athletes being able to to speak out. And I know it doesn't start with Colin Kaepernick. It goes much further back. So can you give us a little bit of a history lesson on this? I think it's good to point out Dr. Harry Edwards, who played a, an integral role in the 1968 Olympics and the protests that happened there with John Carlos, Tommy Smith, and several others. He speaks about four different waves of activism. The first wave came in the early 1900s through 1945. Jack Johnson, the first black world heavyweight boxing champion. Paul Robeson, the first black student at Rutgers University who took the football team to numerous victories. And of course, there's Ohio State's own track legend, Jesse Owens. Back then, this was more so about pushing for recognition and legitimacy and during that time, openly racist society. Wave two, the mid-1940s to the mid-1960s, when tennis player Althea Gibson and others were pushing the limits of the integration of sports. There it is, the new national champion Althea Gibson, the national champion of the United States, as she defeats Louise Brock by scores of 6-3 and 6-2. This wave is about more so breaking the barrier. You know, um, Jackie Robinson is well noted for breaking the color barrier when it comes to baseball. Jackie Robinson steps in against Ford. Deep in the left center, Irv Noren races after Robinson's blast. Jackie really teed off on Ford. Wave three, in the height of the civil rights movement. This is a turning point when sports figures are beginning to speak out about race issues that are not specifically sports related. There's that iconic photo with Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, Bill Russell, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, then known as Luau Cinder. They're supporting Muhammad Ali because of his protests against the Vietnam War. John Singer received his Ph.D. from Ohio State in sport management and is a faculty member at Texas A&M and an associate dean for diversity and inclusion. He says Harry Edwards' work, both as a scholar and an activist, was pivotal in this period. Dr. Harry Edwards was a sociologist who was a really an activist scholar during the civil rights movement who saw the need to really study issues around race, sport, and the experiences of Black athletes. And so Dr. Edwards is considered a pioneer. He didn't do a lot of, I guess, what you call formal research, where he collected data and wrote about the experience of Black athletes. Most of his writings and work was based more on his lived experiences and his organizing the Mexico City Olympics boycott. Edwards, a former scholar athlete from San Jose State, organized the Olympic Project for Human Rights, encouraging Black athletes to boycott the 1968 Summer Olympics. But U.S. runners Tommy Smith and John Carlos went to the Games and placed first and third in the 200-meter race. John Carlos right now, it's Carlos and Smith, and here comes Tommy Smith! Smith has got it! His hands in the air! And then, on the winner's podium, they engaged in silent protest. 
The United States leads the Olympics in medal awards and is just about supreme in the sprint races thanks to men like Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Yesterday, they came in first and third in the 200-meter dash and then stood on the victory platform with bowed heads wearing black socks and gloves in a racial protest. Smith and Carlos raised gloved fists in protest of racism in America and the poverty under which black Americans were forced to live. The response was swift. The two were expelled from the Olympic Games and forced to leave Mexico. Kwame Ajimong. But at those same Olympics, there was a young gymnast from Czechoslovakia at the time named Vera Kozlowska. She also engaged in a silent protest, but she was not removed for the Games. Kozlowska protested the invasion of Czechoslovakia by Russia. She was not removed, but the two black athletes were removed. What followed in the 1970s, say Ajimong and Singer, was a period of stagnation in which black athletes were nearly unwilling to engage in activism. John Singer. What many would describe as a dead period, where you had the commercialism of sport at an all-time high. Think back to some of those commercials with O.J. Simpson when he was running through the airport for Hertz. And you had the rise in athlete endorsements. That, in many ways, stunted and stymied the momentum we had from that Black Power movement and the Civil Rights movement, where you had in the third wave of activism, this focus on power and respect, where these Black athletes were demanding from the white establishment and the sport industry, you're going to give us our respect. What happened during that dead period, really starting probably in the, the 70s through the early 2000s, you know, there was some activism. You had folks like Craig Hodges for the Chicago Bulls or Mamou Abdul Raouf, formerly known as Chris Jackson with the Denver Nuggets. Craig Hodges got let go, right? Oh, yeah. He uh, he, he suffered. And, and, and same with, with uh, Mamou Abdul Raouf. But those types of individual levels of athlete activism were few and far between during this dormant period. You know, a lot of these athletes just didn't really want to take the chance of messing up their money. The infamous quote by Michael Jordan, you know, Republicans buy sneakers too. Why would I speak out against some of the the racism these Republicans and other politicians are engaged in at the systemic level and the more overt level when, you know, they buy my product too, my, my Air Jordans. Jordan admitted this in 2020 saying the comment was made in jest, but that his apolitical stance was probably selfish. Kwame Ajimong. In 2012, I actually wrote an article about Michael Jordan and his impact on the lack of activism at that time. And there was this famous commercial back in the early 90s, Be Like Mike. I wrote that Black athletes at the time were being like Mike more so than just on the court, but in their disregard or not you know, engaging in activism. And it was to the point that William Roden, who wrote a book called The $40 Million Slave, he said that Black athletes at the time had abdicated the responsibility to the Black community compared to what other previous generations had done. John Singer. Think about the backlash, right, or what people call the white lash against some of the progress that was made during the civil rights movement, right? I mean, many of the gains that were gotten, many of them were reversed, particularly in the 80s. And then what do you think was the turning point? When did that all change in that dormant period stop? Edwards talks about how the fourth wave really began at the beginning of the 21st century, within that first decade. If you think about what was going on, we had the election of the first quote unquote black president and Barack Obama. You had the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement. You had the introduction to social media. These black black athletes had a platform. You know, they didn't rely just solely on the mainstream media anymore to define self and, and the social causes they wanted to throw their platform and weight behind. And so I think that 
coming together of all these different things, right? Societal issues really contributed to the fourth wave of, of athlete activism. Social media was a game changer for everyone. In 2012, LeBron James tweeted a photo of the Miami Heat wearing hoodies, bowing their heads in support of teenager Trayvon Martin, whose slaying became another inflection point for anti-racist activism, Kwame Ajama. From then, we started to see a lot more activism. And then we saw in 2014, Eric Garner, the I Can't Breathe t-shirts. T-shirts worn by a host of players, from Kobe Bryant to the Georgetown University men's basketball team. The St. Louis Rams, um, given what happened to uh, Michael Brown, coming out onto the field with their hands up. Five Rams players entered the field displaying the hands up, don't shoot pose. Tight end Jared Cook said they wanted to show their respect to the protesters in Ferguson and around the world. We started to see a lot more activism. There was blowback. Police unions condemned the Rams players' actions. But many in the media were beginning to acknowledge the civil rights violations that players were speaking out against. And then, in 2016, Colin Kaepernick took a knee in a San Francisco 49ers game. We got a lot of criticism for kneeling during the national anthem, but we kneel in respect of a lot of different things. I was going to ask how you interpret that, because you kneel in church a lot of different times before certain dignitaries. Or even when somebody's injured in sports, they take a knee. Why do you think that was taken as such a disrespectful gesture? I think at the end of the day, it goes to people that didn't like what he was doing, didn't really believe what he was saying was true. They don't believe in systemic racism. They don't believe Black people are more likely to get shot by the police. They don't believe that appraisers value Black homes lesser than people from white homes. They don't believe all these different things. I think that goes to show that it wasn't really about the flag. It was really about what he was protesting. But after George Floyd's murder by a Minneapolis police officer captured the world on social media, people began to believe. Kaepernick had been let go by the 49ers, but his protest now resonated. In 2020, the Milwaukee Bucks boycotted a game in protest of another police shooting. The NBA has announced all three of tonight's scheduled playoff games have been postponed. They're following the lead of the Milwaukee Bucks. They were planning to boycott their game tonight against Orlando in protest of the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. Now other players have taken up the mantle. The Women's National Basketball Association has been among the most vocal, taking up voting rights, equity for LGBTQ persons, and stricter gun laws. We live in that intersect, you know, as women in sport, and of course, um, a league of over 80% women of color. Um, you know, it's just it's just a part of who we are. You know, social justice was front and center, and we knew that we had to use our platform the best way that we could to make the difference in our communities and hopefully bring light to awareness and um, causes that are important to us and our fans. College students looking to their counterparts in professional sports are also speaking up. Ohio State football coach Ryan Day joined his players in advocating for change on a video after Floyd's murder. We will no longer stand silent as these issues continue to plague our friends, citizens, neighbors, and teammates. Ohio State alumnus Joy Gaston Gales is a professor of higher education at North Carolina State University. Her scholarship includes equity and inclusion as it relates to college athletics. Part of what happened in that moment was that people felt the need to do something. And so I think students have always tried to organize themselves. Student athletes, it looks a little different because when they come in, sometimes they sign their rights away so that they are not doing things on social media that they might otherwise do. But you couldn't do that in that moment because to to try to silence anybody, student athletes, anybody for that matter, during that time, I don't think is ever the right thing to do, but it definitely wasn't the right thing to do in that moment. Even high school students have begun to defend civil rights, looking to help others who will follow them. The wrestler who had to cut his hair because there was some rule that he couldn't participate because his hair was too long. I think he had dreadlocks. 
And so those kind of cases in which I couldn't speak out in the moment, but later when I got myself together, like what just happened? And other people are speaking out on behalf of athletes when they are mistreated because of views, preferences that they have that don't align with whatever rules are part of athletic associations. The New Jersey ref was suspended and new rules were approved that forbid race discrimination based on hairstyle. And then there's the case of Noor Alexandria Abukaram, a fashion retail studies student at Ohio State. In 2019, while she was running cross country in Toledo, the Muslim high school student found out that she had been disqualified from a race. When my teammates told me that I was disqualified, I asked for what? You have that split second before they answered. Cause I literally, I laughed. I was like, for what? And I thought it was for my bracelet. Cause I always wear a bracelet. And I was like, I should have taken it off. And they were like, no, no, it's not your bracelet. It's because of your hijab. What thoughts were going through your head? I was the only Muslim girl. So I didn't have anything in common with them, um, except for cross country. And it was just really humiliating because it was like that thing was taken away from me, from me having that connection to my teammates. It's so important, especially for like a young girl to have these teammates. So at the moment, I was definitely just really embarrassed. Joy Gaston Gales. We know that we have a multicultural society, yet we still have policies and practices that prevent people from honoring themselves and their values. And it doesn't really make sense as to why. And so is it for safety? I think you can run safely with the hijab. It seems to be more exclusionary than anything else. Abu Karam fought the Ohio High School Athletic Association's rule that barred anyone from wearing a head covering, even for religious purposes, without a waiver. She started an initiative, Let Nor Run. Fighting discrimination and injustices and doing what we love. Um, And that really, at, at first, it started off with centering around shedding light on discrimination in sport and just showing that it's not something that just happened to me in Toledo, Ohio, but it happens to Muslim women and a lot of people all around the world just for things like the hijab, natural hair. There's so many different factors. February 2022, we passed an Ohio law prohibiting organizations from implementing discriminatory policies on the basis of religion. And since then, two other states have also passed a similar law. So right now what we're working on is just like inclusivity in sport and access. It was really important to me to not just tell my story, but also make sure that there's change so that I can not only tell my story, but reassure that I'm doing all the work to make sure that it doesn't happen to others. And I think that's where that kind of came from. And then also being an older sister, having a younger sister, If I'm an activist for anybody, it's for her, because I would never want to see her go through what I've been through. Isn't that what activism is all about? The College of Education and Human Ecology will host an MLK commemorative event on January 24th about the role of sports in advancing civil rights. Ohio State alumnus and NFL player Malcolm Jenkins and others will discuss the issue. A screening of Behind the Shield, The Power and Politics of the NFL, will follow, with a discussion by filmmaker David Zirin and associate professor Kwame Ajimong. See the college's events calendar at ehe.osu.edu for details. <laughs>